Hi everyone, this is uh, Igor from Vinus Reverie, the shop for the adventurous wine drinker. And I will be joined by my co-host Kevin Wank from Wust Imports. And today we're going to be uh, episodes of Afraid to Ask. And we are going to be talking dirt. Dirt of soil. All right, Kevin, thank you for joining me. Hey, Kevin, before we get started, I wanted to ask you this. Has anybody ever told you that you look like LL Cool J? Mm. Uh, I've heard Richard Nixon, but I, <laughs> I, 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 I try to forget that. And, 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 and uh, there's, there's some other sort of uncomplimentary uh, uh, other suggestion of some like dorky actor, but I don't remember who that is. But thank you very much. I'll, lo I'll look into that. <laughs> LL Cool J. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that honor, maybe we'll have some LL Cool J as a background music to our little discussion. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we continue the theme of like, you know, myth busting around yeah. wines. Um, you know, the last uh, time we got together, we were effectively talking about silly ways that people try to get you to buy wine. Yes. And, and, and uh, you know, I don't even want to go into many of the details we discussed there. But one of the funny things to me. Box stores. That, that was like. It, it, yeah, yeah. The methodology, yeah, yeah that they use, yeah. Yeah, but all the different marketing ploys that people use to try to make you think this is such a wonderful wine. And one that I continually see in solicitations, you know, for me to keep track of what a lot of people are doing in the business, I personally sign up for the email lists of all these people who are selling wine online or whatever. And one of the stupidest phrases I think I see is another rock star wine from so-and-so, yeah. you know, and, you know, like, you know, these people are such gods that they can just wave magic wands and create these magical elixirs. Well, the real rock stars are not the winemakers. Yeah. It's the rocks. The rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because most of what you're actually tasting, unless a wine has been, you know, well, I'll put, put it this way, modified with yeah. a lot of new oak barrels, you know, or, you know, what I would call designer yeasts that are designed to, you know, impart flavor and aroma characteristics in, in wines. Most of what you are tasting in wines comes from the minerality in the soil. And, um, you know, in fact, one of the reasons why, in my opinion, that here in Northern California, we have a particular style with a lot of new oak being used is even though this is a great environment for growing grapes, I mean, almost perfect weather all through the growing season. And that's rarely seen in any grape growing region on earth. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you go up to Napa Valley. I mean, it's pretty, yeah. but it's basically flat farmland in the middle of the valley. Yeah. You know, all the minerals in those soils have leached out long ago. Yeah. So, you know, in California, the style, you know, transition to let, let's use a lot of new oak. Let's use specific yeasts, which impart flavor and aroma characteristics. But in other areas that have a lot of natural minerality in the soil, you don't need to do that because you get all these. Uh, uh, jump in for a second. So you're talking about like, uh, so I think some people sometimes see a uh, term commercial yeast versus like native yeast or, or indigenous yeast. Uh, I think that's what you're alluding to, right? California use a lot of these commercial yeast to impart flavor versus a lot of these uh, European winemakers, especially the, the small family-owned uh, uh, farms, they, they typically use native yeast uh, uh, when they do winemaking. Yeah, you know, as some tired grape picker found out somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 years ago, after pitching, picking a bunch of clusters of grapes and then forgetting about them, you know, he came back, you know, a day or two later and found that they were fermenting. And what causes grapes to naturally ferment is there are ambient yeasts in the environment, yeah. you know, and 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 um, and they will start the fermentation process spontaneously. One thing I'd like to clarify, though, about cultured yeast is you can have what are completely neutral cultured yeasts mm -hmm. that add no flavor or aroma characteristics at all. But you know, as the wine industry is continually looking for new ways to sell you wine. There's also a lot of activity developing, 
you know, specific, you know, strains of cultured yeast that do add aromas or flavors. Yeah. But when you're in areas of high minerality, you don't need to do that. And that's why you find a lot more naturally fermented wines in Europe too, because you're getting all these interesting characteristics from the minerals in the soil itself. You know, and then, you know, you've got the ambient yeasts in the area and it creates what in combination, you know, a lot of people, you know, would call terroir. You know, it's the characteristics that you typically get in a wine from those regions. Yeah. And, you know, I look at the basic minerality, you know, as four principal rock types. Yeah. Uh, you've got slate, um, which, in my opinion, uh, you know, gives you sort of deeper penetrating flavors, um, you know, persistence on the palate. Uh, you've got granite. Um you know, anybody who likes to hike in the uh, great outdoors has probably hiked in some rocky areas. And maybe you stopped by a mountain stream at one point and drank some fresh water out of the mountain stream. I mean, you're drinking water that's coming from a granitic environment yeah. and it tastes refreshing to you. Yeah. you know, and so from, from granite, you, you get wines that have this sort of freshness to them, this purity to them, sort of precision to them. You know, and then... Um, you're going on from there, uh, you know, you know the, you've got, you know, a lot of areas that, particularly Italy, that have volcanic activity. What I get from wines that are grown in volcanic soils, you know, is sort of this depth of flavor um, and that it, it accentuates the, the, the different native varietals. I mean, Italy is fascinating itself because you have, you know, probably 200 native varietals that are being made into wine in any meaningful quantities. And then you've got the, you know, you know, the volcanic soil in, in, in Italy that then accentuates the intrinsic flavor characteristics. I mean, one of the more interesting things to me, I mean, one of my favorite grapes is Sangiovese. And although there are people in California that are making good Sangioveses, I mean, boy, the Sangioveses out of Italy taste very, very different than the Sangioveses produced in California. Because again, in California, you're kind of growing it on flat farmland. So you've got to do some things to it, you know, to make it fully express itself. In Italy, littered with all these volcanoes, you didn't need to do anything to it. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you get, you, you know, the richer, deeper flavors. And also, uh, you know, what I would, you know, normally experience as a, what I call a saturated finish, where yeah. the back part of your mouth is just, sort of like coated with all these minerals, you know, from the wine yeah. coming out of volcanic soils. And then the, 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 the fourth one I'm going to, uh, I'm going to mention is, um, sorry here. Limestone. Right? My notes every day. Limestone, yeah. limestone. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is actually my, my favorite. Um, you know, limestone, you know, is formed from, you know, sedimentary deposits that have been exposed to, you know, a lot of moisture and, 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 and compression. And limestone has somewhat different characteristics than what I described with some of the others. But for me, any wines grown in a limestone terroir, they're refreshing to my palate, yeah. you know. And, and uh, you know, it's almost like, you know, having a granite between courses at a, you know, yeah. You know, and you know, and you know, and a you know, multi-course meal or something. Yeah. And then also, as somebody who likes to cook, uh, to me, the limestone it accentuates the flavors in the food. I mean, it really just brings alive the flavors in the food. Now, all this sounds you know conceptually interesting, but you know, how how do you then add to your enjoyment of wine from all this? Yeah. Well, let me go back to my notes again here, yeah. and and. Uh, at this time of night, I forget things. You know, I'm at my, an advanced age, too, so, you know, that, that contributes. But, you know, slate, where are you going to find this? Well, so mainly people think of it in Germany. The yeah. principal parts in Germany are very steep river banks, particularly in the Rheingau, where the Rhine goes through, and then in the Moselle, where, of course, the Moselle goes through. Yeah, and, um, but... Uh, there's another interesting part of Europe where you have, you know, and also in the Moselle and the Rheingau, it's mainly Riesling, although there's some Pinot Noir grown in the Moselle that, or, or in, in the Rheingau that's also really remarkable Pinot Noir. You know, it's the only place on earth, really, that, that slate is used 
to grow Pinot Noir. But northeastern Spain, in the region of the Priorat, yeah. and then on the north side of Monsant, you also have a lot of slate. Yeah. Uh, my Monsant producer, uh, well, northeastern Spain is also Catalonia, where the native language is Catalan. Yeah. And my Monsant producer, Singlus Blaus. Well, what on earth does that mean? Yeah. In Catalan, it means blue cliffs. You know, and so you're walking through the vineyards, you look up at the ridges and the rock faces of the ridges are all blue. Yes. You know, and so that's why this particular producer decided to call his winery Singless Blouse, Blue Cliffs and you know, in, in Catalan. But I described that from slate, you get this persistence across the palate, you know, and then sort of deeper penetrating flavors. Yes. And in northeastern Spain, they're mainly growing Garnacha and, and Carignana, or Grenache and Carignan. Yes. And those reds, to me, have the same mouthfeel mm -hmm. as when I'm drinking Rieslings, yeah. you, know, for, you know, from Germany. And, and so I'm like, God, this is fascinating. So again, as I, you know, as I described earlier, in an industry where people are trying to hype this and hype that and talk about rock star winemakers, You've got two completely different grape types, not just white and red, but I mean, frankly, there is just no similarity at all in the characteristics of Riesling, you know, regardless of it being a white and the characteristics of, of you know, Grenache or Carignan. Yes. And to taste the same thing across my mid palate, yeah. you know, from both of those wines. I mean, you know, th that's pretty interesting, you know, and then, you know, granite. Um, so for, to sum up slate, you know, mainly in Germany and the Rheingau and the Moselle, and then northeastern Spain and the Priorat, you know, and and uh, and Monsant. And we get to granite. And, you know, granite is present in a lot of different oh, places. Okay. Kevin, can I, before we get to granite, so uh, obviously uh, you you mentioned those are some of the most you know, famous wine regions. The Moselle uh, you, you know, makes legendary Rieslings and obviously uh, Grenache from Priorat. But uh, I don't know what, what is your because uh, because there's different like you were mentioning blue, but uh, uh, Priorat is known for their black slates versus the Mosul has I think blue slate and red slate. Uh, uh, so uh, you've been to those regions. So is it just like the the, the pigmentation of the of the soils, or, or or is there different characteristics to the different colors of the uh, uh, slate soils? It will relate to the other minerals present in the area. The red slates are in areas where there's been significant iron deposits. Okay. Yeah, and, and so, you know, those iron deposits have leached into the slate, you know, in the evolutionary process of the geology of those areas. You know, and iron is interesting too, because iron really like brings out the flavor in a wine. Yeah. And, 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 uh, yeah, I've got an interesting Pinot Noir from the Rheinhessen. There's a, uh, area in the eastern side of the Rheinhessen, right next to the Rhine River. It's called the Roter Hang. Uh, uh, in, in German, it's Red Slope. And the Pinot Noirs in that area just have this, like, rich, deep, penetrating flavors. That are similar to Vaux Romanis, yeah, and from yeah. you know from, from from Burgundy, and Burgundy itself is fascinating because what you have in Burgundy is this roughly thirty mile long stretch that, of course, now is flat, but it was originally a sedimentary you know ocean bottom, and you know through eons all these different layers of materials you know, settled layer by layer by layer by layer by layer, you know, all, you know, all these different minerals, you know, in each subsequent layer. And then some, you know, geologic event at one point takes the, the you know, this, you know, this sedimentary uh, ocean bottom and just turns it like 90 degrees where it's now flat in each of these layers is now in like a 30 mile stretch across Burgundy. Mm -hmm. That's why in Burgundy, you know, you can basically go mile by mile and the wines taste different. Yeah. You know, it's all Pinot Noir for the reds. Yeah. It's all Chardonnay for the whites. Yeah. But mile by mile, they will taste different. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 um, Wait, that's I mean, it was for, yeah. That. 
Yeah, and then that's what's just delightful and really intriguing about Burgundy. And you've got this one little pocket right in the middle of the Codes and the Wheats of Von Romany, you know, where you've got Domain Romany County. Yes. And you get all these iron deposits, yes. you know, in the Von Romanys in particular. Yes. Yeah, and, 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 and uh, which is similar to then what you get from the Rotor Hang, you know, in, in, in the Rhine Essence. So red slates would come from areas where there were significant iron deposits, yeah. you know, which, which, which then, you know, accentuates sort of the rich penetrating flavors in the wines. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, you know, as, as I say, you're, you know, you know, unless you're going to mask all this with a lot of new oak, yes. you know, and cultured yeast, I mean, you're basically tasting the rocks in the wines. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes you do taste it. That's why it's so uh, beautiful to just uh, taste wines from all these places. But but it, even more so, it's it's these kind of sub regions within the places. You know the the the, the micro area, the terroir, like you mentioned. It's uh, just how a particular piece of land just gives you a unique expression of a wine. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's why I think wine is the most interesting consumer product. Yeah. I mean, you think particularly with the world dominated by huge companies and how do you make more money? Well, first, you sell more stuff. And secondly, you create a more uniform product. So you've got lower production costs. Yep. But, you know, it's sort of the, the way to fight back about that. Drink more wine. Get more adventurous. <laughs> yeah, explore. Well, 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 last episode, right? I mean, uh, uh, some of the bigger companies and conglomerates, they're trying to do that with the cultured ease. They're trying to make... Uh, more uniform wine, and that's uh, that's why we try to bust this myth that uh, it's not a commodity. It's uh, it's a uh, you know artistic product. I don't know if you know a, a better way of saying that. Yes, um, going on to the next uh, yeah. you know mineral type in the areas that it is. You know, I just described granite, where you you know I sense this sort of like purity and freshness and precision in the wines. And granite's everywhere. I mean, so, I mean, other than it's like flat farming areas, you know, anywhere that there have been some mountains, you're going to find some granite, you know. And, you know, the, the more prominent regions that people are probably better, you know, acquainted with, you know, the northern Rhone. Um, you know, as the Rhone goes farther and farther north, uh, it cuts this V-shaped valley. And there is just nothing but granite on either side, uh, you know, of that valley. And, you know, Syrah, which has kind of like, uh, you know, a mixed audience. There's some people that love it, some people that hate it. But Syrah expressed in the granite of the Northern Rhone is just spectacular. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and uh, sort of the uh, deep flavors and the spiciness of Syrah, it's, it's, it's sort of enriched by the granite soil and adds the precision and the purity that I'm describing that you typically get out of granite. But, you know, some, some other areas, um, Alsace is pretty interesting. You know, uh, you know, I think in general, people look at wine regions as having fairly uniform characteristics, but Alsace um, is about 50 miles from north to south. And southern Alsace has a lot more granite. Uh, northern Alsace, as you move, you know, towards the Faltz region in Germany, mm -hmm. which has some volcanic components in the soil, mm -hmm. you know, has, you know, some volcanic aspects to it. Yeah. You know, and, and so, you know, people look at, you know, Alsatian wines as kind of this, you know, obscure region that they don't know all that much about. But in my experience, the wines taste pretty different from the southern part of Alsace, where you've got much more granite, to the northern part of Alsace, where you've got volcanic influences. You know, and, and, uh, and then other regions where you've got the granite, um, southern Rhone, you know, typically kind of flatter farmland, uh, alluvial river valleys, but you've got some mountains to the east of the southern Rhone. Um, in fact, a wine you tasted today, the Vontu Blanc, Yes. Uh, so Mont Fontu is the tallest mountain in southern France. Yeah. It's about 4,500 uh, or in the or in the southern Rhone, about 4,500 feet in elevation. You know, my producer is about midway up the slope of, of Mont Fontu. You know, you walk through the vineyards, big chunks of rocks, you know, and you taste a lot more minerality and freshness in that guy's wine than you taste in the, you know, the white 
Southern Rhone wines that are grown in the flatter farmland. Yeah. Uh, some other areas with a lot of granite. Um, oh, Rousselon, um, in the Languedoc Rousselon area, uh, you have the Pyrenees, mm -hmm. you know, that divide, you know, France from Spain. Yes. And Rousselon is the southernmost area right next to the Pyrenees in what's overall called Languedoc Rousselon, you know, and, uh, and you, you again taste sort of the purity and the freshness and the precision of a lot of wines from Rousselon. Um, hey, oh, you know, let me jump in. You know what you mentioned is very interesting. Uh, kind of uh, when we were talking about slate, you were mentioning you know Priorat versus Monsant, and now you, you, you Northern Rhone versus uh, Roussillon, and, and uh, both of them have you know the same soils. But one region, Priorat, for example, that's the like, world-renowned region, and the wines are expensive from that region. Whereas Monsant, you can get some great deals because it's kind of yet undiscovered area th that makes very interesting wines from the same, you know, black slate soils that Priorat is famous for. And just the same way, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the prices for Northern Rhone wines, you know, the Conrotis or the Hermitages are, you know, out of this world. Whereas uh, Roussillon, you could get probably the best values in the whole wine world if you if, if they come from a particular plot of land uh, in that uh, region so, so yeah yeah you know as in the i mean in the northern round the wines are almost 100 percent syrah yeah 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 and 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 uh where in Rousselon, you know the, the typical blend is like 50 percent syrah you know and then you know grenache and mouvedre and and and, and some carignan yeah but you know, you can still taste the expression of that Syrah grown in the granitic soils of Rousselon yes. as you do in the, you know, granitic soils of the Northern Rhone. Right. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, and, and, and so that's why I effectively just travel around Europe looking for soil types. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and because I know how those soil types will express themselves in the wine. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, yeah, you know, it sometimes takes a while to then find wines that are true to that expression because, you know, another unfortunate part of this business is, you know, you've got all these consultants wandering around trying to tell people what their wines need to taste like so they can sell more of them, you know, and that ruins, you know, everything of what we're talking about, you know, and, and um, you know, to me, I just want to taste the grapes. Yeah. I mean, other people may want a different experience with wine, and if they do, I respect that. But, you know, it's really fascinating to explore the differences in terms of how all these grapes then express themselves in all these different soil types. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, and, you know, Italy is thought of as mainly a volcanic area, but there's a lot of granite in Italy, too. You know, northern Italy, you know, you know bordering the Alps, you know, and, and, you know Alto Adige, you know, Valtellina, Val d'Aosta. Um, you've got a lot of granite in all of those wines. You definitely taste it. But even, uh, you know, mid to southern peninsula, you know, you have the southern, uh, you know, Apennines coming down the peninsula. And there's some volcanic influences, you know, affecting them too. But those are all granite mountains. Yeah. So, you know, in areas of central Campania, you know, you've got, you know, you know similar granitic, you know, tasting wines as you have up in the Alps. And Central Campania, uh, can, you know, can you give like a little more specific uh, what like area? And, and, are we talking about white grapes? You're not talking about Alianico because I think that's uh, mostly on volcanic soils of Campania. Well, the you know it depends on where it's it's grown, and 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 um, I have um, uh, both a Falangina and an Alianico that's grown in what's called the Sanio Hills around uh, Beneventano. Yes. And I mean, they have all these granite characteristics to them, where then merely 30 miles away, I have some wines that uh, are grown on Mount Vesuvius, yes. you know, that have, you know, just all these volcanic characteristics. And you know, the volcanic characteristics, you know, as I mentioned before, sort of like richer, deeper flavors, you know, this is like fully saturated finish. In one area of Italy, that you know is not as well known, even though you've got you know one, one of the world's great cities right in the middle of the area. But it's Lazio. You know, I mean, Rome is surrounded by volcanoes. You know, and I've done really well with my Lazio wines. I mean, 
people never even heard of them. And, uh, you know, but, you know, it's like they taste, you know, these just really expressive flavors. And it comes from all the volcanoes that, you know, had surrounded Rome. You know, there's this one producer um, about 40 miles north of Rome uh, on the north shore of what's called Lago Bolsina. And Lago Bolsina is formed from the collapsed caldera of an ancient volcano. And it's about 15 miles north to south and about 10 miles from east to west. So you can just imagine how huge this volcano must have been. But you go down to the shore of Lago Bolsino, black sand beaches. Yeah. And I'm not talking like gray sand. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about dark black sand beaches on the shoreline of Lago Bolsino. And, you know, the wines from that area then have all the characteristics that I've described in terms of the deep penetrating flavors and the, you know, the fully saturated finish. Well, well very nice. So, I mean, uh, let's, uh, should we tra just transition more into volcanic, uh, uh, volcanic soils? Uh, you know, you were mentioning earlier how limestone is your favorite. I, I would probably have to say that, uh, you know, tasting wines over the last, you know, year, year and a half, uh, vo volcanic soils might be my favorite wines right now. There's some, Man, there's some spectacular wines uh, from all different parts of the world growing volcanic soils that just uh, have this particular minerality or salinity to it and kind of th this depth that, that's hard to replicate uh, uh, from other, I think, soils. Yeah, in fact, one of the more interesting expressions of it uh, that I've seen in, in my portfolio is, I mean, there was some volcanic activity you know, in southern Ger or, or what's south in southwestern Germany, starting from the southern part of the Faltz reg region. The Faltz region in Germany is not as well known, but it's basically midway between Alsace in France and the Rheingau or where Frankfurt is, yeah. you know, in Germany. You know, and the, the northern part of the Faltz region, you know, has, you know, some limestone characteristics. The southern part of the Faltz region, you know, it's more volcanic soil, you know, and then all the way down, you know, at the southwest corner of Germany in Baden, you also have a lot of volcanic soil. And, you know, you ha you've had some of the, the Z-Risen Pinot Noirs in your shop, you know, and you can taste, you know, those like, you know, just kind of penetrating, brooding, almost haunting flavors that come from those, you know, you know, from those Pinot Noirs and the long lingering finish, you know, from that volcanic soil. You know, Burgundy is a great place for Pinot Noir with all the limestone and all the other characteristics of the minerals in the soil there. But you don't have, you know, those sort of richer penetrating flavors that you get from the Pinot Noirs that are grown, you know, in various places from volcanic soil. Hey, so, uh, Kevin, I, I actually did a little bit of a background, and you, you probably you know, are familiar with all these aspects, but some of the characteristics of volcanic soils is uh, it's uh, finely grained, uh, it retains and reflects heat, very, uh, it drains well, and it holds uh, water uh, well, and it has a lot of r rich nutrients, like you were mentioning earlier, iron, magnesium, potassium, uh, calcium. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, and, and I've read somewhere that uh, maybe uh, it was fighting off uh, uh, phylloxera better than other parts of the world because it's so uh, um, uh, infertile that uh, the microbes could not grow in the soil. So, so it's better, so, so a lot of them have kind of, I guess, original rootstock, which may be, may be also part why the wines are so dynamic uh, uh, very frequently. Yeah, the... Um... Um, God, there's a great thought I just had that I hadn't thought of before. Now I've promptly forgotten it. No, I'm not drinking tonight. So, <laughs> but you know, it was it was about volcanic soils. Oh, the the color of it. Yes. And 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 uh, so this is a, fa a fascinating part in terms of how grapes mature. Yes. And obviously, the sun is up in the sky, yes. you know, and directing heat down into vineyards yes. okay so that's where we think of is where the source of heat is and but when you've got things like slate which is dark mm -hmm. volcanic soils which are typically dark yeah. the sun hits those soils and reflects back up through the vines yes and 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 uh 
And so you have, in my opinion, from what I taste of the wines in these areas, yeah. is you have more even ripening of the grapes yeah. from those areas than you do where you basically just, you know, have sort of regular farm type soils with which just absorb the heat and don't reflect it back up through the vines. And one of the more fascinating examples of this, although it doesn't, uh, uh, it's not directly connected, sure. you know, you know, to the actual color of the rocks on the ground. But the Rheingau, um, you know, to a lot of people, oh, it's just another German wine region. But the 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 Rhine River, which most people will think of, oh, it starts in Switzerland and flows north to the North Sea. Yeah. Well, it pretty much does directly north. Yeah. But you've got this fifteen mile stretch. Uh, that's directly west of Frankfurt, or turns to the west, yeah. goes west for 15 miles, and then turns north again. Mm -hmm. And all the vineyards are on the north slope of the river. And the sunlight, so you've got all the slate in the vineyards of the Rheingau to begin with, that will reflect the sun up through the vines. But as you're standing in the vineyards at midday, you will see a reflection on the river as the sun hits the river yeah. and then ref also reflects heat up through the vineyards. Yeah. And uh, so that's another fascinating part of, of, of all this, to, you know, to, to see just how all this works and location by location. Yeah. Well, somebody said magic in the glass. And I mean, I think you just described that, uh, uh, how that process, you know, uh, gets to, to that point. It's yes. Like, yes. So, so, I mean, some of the most famous uh, uh, regions, we just talked about uh, Mount Vesuvius in Campania. Uh, that makes Alianico, which is a, you know, uh, they call it Barolo of the s South, even though it's a grape, I think it's still finding its way. But uh, when it's uh, uh, made well, it's a uh, long age. Well, that's another part of the volcanic soils is they frequently make long aged wines also. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, one of the aspects that I, you know, at least read about. Uh, yeah, be I mean, he here's my... Um, my guess about volcanic soils and longevity of the wines is, you know, the vines have to dig so deeply in those soils yes. that the grapes are just filled with all this like dense mineral content. Yeah. And that will help how long these wines will age. I mean, there are Tauruses from the, the most prestigious area of Alianico growing in Campania is this little village called Tarsi, which is in this little basin with volcanic ridges all, you know, all, you know, all, all around it. Yeah. And I mean, Tarsis will age beautifully for 30 to 40 years. Yeah. And I mean, a, a lot of people in southern Italy, they wouldn't even dream of opening a Tarsi, you know, until it's like at least 10 years old. And it's not because it has too many tannins or all that, but they just want to wait for the magic that that area can create in its wines. And, and just, you know, uh, uh, you know Master Berardino is probably you know, the most known producer for, from, from that area. Uh, just to give a note, uh, 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 in the tasting maybe done within the last couple of years, their 1928 authority got like 95 points. So, you know. Mm -hmm about a, a, a wine that was 90 years old at the point it was tasted at and it was still you know drinking spectacularly uh -huh. yeah yeah I, I i love the wines you know unfortunately alianico is just not really you know reached you know a uh, you know level of prominence as you know as you know nebbiolo and barolo or pinot noir and burgundy but it makes extraordinary wines they're they're very food friendly too I mean, I get a huge amount of food pairing ideas out of every Alianico that I have. Well, and so, you know, to kind of go with that, uh, Sicily, probably the most famous uh, uh, volcanic wine in the world. Uh, Mount Etna, uh, so obviously they're known for their Etna uh, uh, Rosos, which is based on Narella Mascalese grape, or, or Caricante, uh, uh, the, the white grape, the, the, the Etna Biancos. Um, yeah, N Norella Mascalese is, is interesting in that um, I described earlier that, you know, I have some examples of Pinot Noirs yes. that are grown in soils, you know, with some volcanic content in it, either in southern faults or in, you know, southwestern Germany, you know, in Baden. Um, but uh, Norella Mascalese 
you know, in my opinion, it has some elements of Pinot Noir, and it has some elements of Nebbiola. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, I already earlier described that volcanics, you know, you know, characteristics in the soil can make Pinot Noir come alive. And in my opinion, it really makes the Norella Mascalese come alive, too. And, and uh, I mean, you can do some blind tastings of Norella Mascalese from, from Mount Etna. And people are like, huh, is, is this a Barbaresco? Yeah. You know, or, huh, you know, is this, is this like, a, is this a Pinot Noir? Yes. yes. And, you know, and, and, and uh, maybe it's because people don't drink Norella Mascalese all that much, you know, that, but, I mean, to me, it'd be almost like a blend if you blended Nebbiolo and Pinot Noir together. You know, and that's what's fascinating about it, because you've got, you know, the different characteristics of the grape and then the environment in which it's grown, which then adds to the complexity of all that. I well, mean, you know, I mean, uh, oh, go ahead. Um, I was, I found uh, a Pinot from Mount Etna. Uh, and, you know, when I was tasting it, I was like, man, it tastes a lot like the Rome So, yeah. <laughs> just... <laughs> well, that's because they're very so. I mean, they have no genetic connection. But they're very similar in yeah. how they express themselves in terms of flavors and and you know, aromas. But and, and I do know that people are starting to grow Pinot on you know on Mount Etna. And I mean, this whole business is actually kind of funny because you know, everybody wants to make a little bit more money here and there. You know, and you know, they know that the world knows Pinot Noir a lot better than they know Norella Mascalese. You know, and it's probably Pinot Noir is probably a bit more pronounceable than Norello Mascalese. You know, and so yes, there are people on Mount Etna that are starting to plant vineyard vineyards of Pinot Noir. It, it, interesting. I, I mean, I think the, these wines are you know spectacular. And, and, and the funny thing about them is, it's really uh, from, from the way I understand, it, it's really like twenty years ago when they had the big kind of investment rush. Uh, to Mount Etna. Before it was just like you know a bunch of poor farmers making you know sitting on like uh, uh, you know uh, uh, gold basically. The, the soil is gold. They didn't know about it until kind of like some of the more affluent producers from other you know like from Bordeaux or from Tuscany started buying up land. And slowly but surely you know the prices of these wines are going up. Uh, and they're they're you know fascinating wines. Yeah, and another interesting part of that, we, we talked about the characteristics of volcanic soils where they're very dense and the phylloxera, the phylloxera uh, you know, bug, you know, was not able to get into them. And you mentioned about Edna at one point it was, you know, just this poor farming area. And what people have found are these old abandoned vineyards with like 150-year-old vines. You know, and they've resuscitated them and they've taken the rootstock from those vines, you know, and, you know, and then, you know, replanted vineyards with this ancient rootstock, you know, and they're making extremely expressive wines. Yeah. You know, that's what's just so much fun about this. I mean, just to explore and to have all these different experiences. And, and you know, just to, to kind of go go quickly, maybe about some of the. I mean, it'd be fun, I think, to discuss a lot of these regions in details, maybe uh, separately, but like, uh, 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 Assyrtico from Santorini, which is uh, different than Assyrtico from, I think, mainland uh, 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 Greece, but it's, uh, I think it's a noble grape. Uh, everything I've tasted is absolutely spectacular. It's, uh, you know, obviously uh, volcanic soil surrounded by water, so you got this, you know, combination of, you know, the salinity and minerality that's just off the charts, I think. Uh, I, I don't know if you, you know, you don't have a Cetico in your catalog, but I don't know if you've had before and kind of your thoughts on it. Yeah, the, uh, well, it's all Greek to me with the Greek wines, because unfortunately, I have not tasted Greek wines in a long time. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, ori the original, you know, um, idea of what I'm doing is just to explore almost every wine region in, in Europe. I just haven't gotten to, you know, to, to Greece yet. But uh, you mentioned with, um, uh, uh, you know, the salinity that you get, you know, from, you know, a, um, you know, a, a, you know, a wine that's grown near the sea. And that is another fascinating part of this. Um, you know, the, um, I have some wines from Abruzzo on the east coast of, you know, of, of Italy, where the vineyards are all within, you know, five to six miles of the Adriatic. 
and you smell that salinity in the wine. Yeah. I mean, there's some interesting, you know, minerality in the soil in Abruzzo too. You know, a combination of granite that's washed down from the seven to 8,000 foot peaks that are, you know, themselves only like 12 to 15 miles from, you know, from, from the sea. And then you get all this salinity and it's a really fun, fascinating expression and particularly the white grapes in Abruzzo. Yeah, uh, it's, man, I, we could go on that. So, you know, just a few more uh, references. So Canary Islands, also famous for the volcanic source, Madeira, uh, the Azores Islands. So a lot of the uh, uh, islands uh, uh, have volcanic activity. And then even uh, going something local like Mount Vitor in Napa, w which got some uh, uh, volcanic uh, activity and makes some really intense uh, wines. Uh, but, you know, I'm right here. I'm drinking, you know, for today's show, uh, I'm drinking Ufark from Somlo, which is in central Hungary. So obviously Tokai, uh, uh, you know, is also famous because uh, it's got, uh, I think I read 400 volcanoes uh, lined up. So it's like a lot of just volcanic activity. Uh, and you know, it's, it's funny as a side note, how like a lot of, uh, 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 you know, wine uh, activity, it's, it's trendy. Uh, I recently, I've heard somebody say uh, something to the effect, oh, I didn't even know that Hungary made wines, which is <laughs> like a funny statement, right? Because from like 17th to 19th century, these were the most famous wines in the world. I mean, all the royalty were drinking uh, Hungarian wines. And now it's kind of like, oh, I think, you know, I thought it was the world ends after, you know, Bordeaux and Napa. It, it, it kind of it, it situation is just fascinating. Yeah, 200 years ago, Tokai from Hungary was the most expensive wine in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, well, the the royalty, I think, on their deathbed, they were drinking it because they thought it was, they were like magic elixirs. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but this, this one is not from Tokai; it's from Shomlo, which is the smallest appellation in uh, Hungary, and, and the Ufar grape. Uh, so, so, so I, I've never been to the area. Before. The way I understand it, it's, it's like a flatland, and then there's like a big hill that used to be a volcano, and a uh, Ufar grows on that hill, and it's. Uh, it's, I mean, fiercely, fierce minerality. When I drank it, the minerals just jump at you. You know, frequently the fruit kind of jumps first at you and then the minerals kind of uh, lag on, on the finish. Well, this is like uh, the minerality hits you first and you're just kind of looking for fruit. It's just like a nice wine that you could have, I think, with, with like meat. Uh, uh, it's so fascinating and it's so distinctive. So, you know, I, I, for our discussion, I'm like, well, I'm going to pull something like, you know, geeky as uh, something from uh, the, the, the soils that I love, uh, which are volcanic soils. Mm -hmm. But then let's go to your favorite soils, limestone. Yeah, the, um, so, you know, as I described on s some of the calls, I like to cook. You know, and one of the, you know, and one of the principal um, criteria for me in selecting wines is all the food pairings I get. You know, if I don't get a lot of food pairings, I do not select the wine. You know, and I'm looking for wines that bring out the flavors in food. And I'm also looking for wines that have a lot of versatility in the food pairings. And where you get that from particular mineral composition in the soil is limestone. I mean, limestone, um, it just seems to, I mean, I described it earlier as kind of a granite, which refreshes your your, your palate, which in itself is good when enjoying it with food, you know, because, you know, after each bite, you know, you, you will, you know, have a sip of a limestone infused wine and it's refreshing. It complements the flavors of the food. It accentuates the flavors of the food, but also refreshes your palate where you want that next bite. And then you want that next sip of wine. Yeah. And you should see how fast I go through a bottle of Chablis. <laughs> I mean, you, you, cook, you cook some nice white fish and have a sip of Chablis and have another bite and another sip of Chablis. It's like, whoa, where'd that bottle go? <laughs> That's really Why not go from like, you know, to, uh, from a uh, village level to a premier crew Chablis? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting the way the Appalachians have worked in Chablis because, you know, it looks like this kind of like qu crazy quilt of like, well, you know, why why is this a premier crew here? And, you know, wh why is this a grand crew over there? And it's directly related to the limestone concentration in the soil. 
yeah. you know, and somehow they figured this all out, you know, o- you know, over the years. And, you know, the, you know, the, the main Chablis um, or a high or the Chablis hierarchy mm-hmm. is you have putty Chablis, which is typically the ridge tops, yeah. you know, and, 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 um, you know, where there's not all that much mineral content on those ridge tops, you know, and, and, um, you know, and then you've got, you know, village level Chablis or just the AOC Chablis. And it's as you start going down those ridges towards, you know, you know, you know towards the valley floor. But then in areas where there's more significant limestone deposits, you know, the beginning level of that is you have, you know, what are uh, uh, roughly 40 premier crew vineyards. You know, and then in the area with the most significant limestone deposit, which is actually directly across the river from the village, it's these perfect south-facing slopes, is you've got seven Grand Crus. Yeah. You know, and those have the, you know, the, you know, the highest amount of limestone. You know, and, and these, you know, classifications were made about 200 years ago. You know, and so somebody had figured all that out, you know, 200 years ago as to, you know, you know, you know, where, you know, you get different flavor characteristics from different parts of Chablis. And um, I have a, you know, fairly, you know, obsessive and nutty group of winemakers anyway. Uh, I mean, they're fanatics about being out in their vineyards every day. And my Chablis producer is a great guy, um, but he, (laughs) he apparently knows what the grapes taste like on every vine. Yeah. In his vineyards. Yeah. And uh, so he creates these little special cuvées. Um, there's this one really fascinating part of, you know, of one of his vineyards where you get all these appley notes in his Chablis um, that's similar to what you would get from a really, really expensive champagne. Yeah. You know, and so he's created a special cuvée. I mean, it's still just, you know, what you might call a village level Chablis, you know, an a- it's not a petty Chablis, but an AOC Chablis, but it's just all these expressive things that you don't normally taste in other Chablis, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, uh, but, you know, Chablis is mainly, you know, an area of limestone. Burgundy is an area of limestone. Um, the upper Loire uh, is definitely an area of limestone, Sancerre. Puy sur Loire across the river where you get Puy Fume, you know, other areas, you know, down the Loire, uh, you know, you get, you know, a reasonable amount of limestone, you know, the Cabernet Francs uh, from around the, um, uh, the Chinon, uh, Bourget and Samur area, you know, you've got an interesting combination of compressed limestone, which is, you know, in the area called Tufa, that you know, you've got some richer, deeper flavors, but you still have the refreshing aspects that I've you know described earlier about the limestone, and then you know down near the sea where all the muscadets are are, are grown. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you you taste the same thing. This is from all these alluvial river deposits that have been deposited over eons by non. You know where you know the you know the muscadets, which are you know grown from Malone to Bourgogne, you yeah. know are. You know, our uh, our ground. And, and uh, those are actually uh, muscadets. Uh, sometimes you almost like uh, feel like you're licking limestone. They have such yeah. uh, such minerality to them. Uh, but they're uh, surprisingly uh, I, 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 frequently a lot of them uh, could age longer than Sancerre's. Uh, 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 you know, you could uh, have some of them eight, ten years old. And I know frequently Sancerre's. Uh, many times you should drink them within like, you know, five years. Uh, yeah. And I mean, the, uh, I think, you know, this is just my personal opinion, but, you know, I don't think Sauvignon Blanc is, you know, a good aging grape. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, p- you know, people are drinking it for its freshness, its expressiveness, you know, and there are ways of making it that can age longer. Mm-hmm. But, you know, M- Malone de Bourgogne, yeah. is related to Chardonnay. Yes. You know, Char- Chardonnay, can, you know, can age for a long time if made properly. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, the, uh, you know, for my birthday last year, you know, I had a 20-year-old white burgundy. And frankly, or sadly, it was my last bottle of that particular wine. 
<laughs> but it's like, you know, it's like it could have aged for another 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. So the muscadets are thought of as something, though, it's just this light, refreshing thing that you eat with fresh seafood. But, oh, they will age for a long time if you make them well. Yeah. No, as, yeah, the characteristics of the limestone wines is pretty, pretty fascinating. I mean, uh, I know you had on the list Kaor, which is, you know, Malbec area, but it's a completely different expression of Malbec than the Argentinian Malbec. And, and probably the, the soil has something to do with that. Yeah, so I don't know enough about the actual geology of why this happened. Yeah. But surrounding the area of Gore in southwest France, there are these limestone plateaus that some geologic event pushed up out of the earth. And in my opinion, the Malbecs that are grown up on those plateaus um, just sort of like burst in your mouth with all this flavor and, you know, and, you know, this like palate refreshing characteristics, you know, and, you know, the Malbecs that are grown down the river valley, they're sort of like denser and more one dimensional, you know, and you get more of the tannins out of them. Were the ones that are grown up on the ridges, I mean, you know, I mean, similar to, I mean, this is not limestone we're talking about, but it's similar to the situation. I mean, you, uh, you know, Napa Valley. I mean, you mentioned Mount Veter, you know, on the east side of the valley, you also have Howell Mountain, which was an old volcano, you know, and, and so, you know, the, the grapes will express themselves much more differently based on, you know, being at higher elevations where there's more mineral content in the rockier soils. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, you know, co- co- or you uh, you you know you, you will make you know in my opinion the Malbec you know you sort of come alive and you know be more refreshing in its expression. Another interesting area where you've got quite a bit of limestone is the Ribera de Duero yeah. uh, in northwestern Spain. Um, you know where mainly Tempranillo is grown, although you know people. Or adding Bordeaux varietals such as Cabernet Sauvignon and, 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 and Merlot to that. But um, I mean, this is an old seabed, you know, and, and um, you know, and limestone is often found in all these old seabeds. You know, in my Ribeiro de Duero, you know, uh, producer's vineyards walking through, I mean, you still see, you know, broken up old seashells, you know, and I mean, this is about you know, a mile north of the Duero on a hill that, you know, slopes up to a ridge. But, you know, you've got a combination of, you know, limestone in the vineyards. Um, there also, is, you know, is a lot of, you know, volcanic, or not volcanic, but iron content in that particular section of the Ribera de Duero. And I already mentioned Burgundy, where you've got the combination of, you know, of limestone and iron, you know, and von Romany. And even though we're talking about Tempranillo and the Ribera de Duero, you know, I can taste similarities into how that Tempranillo expresses itself versus, you know, how the, you know, you know, Pinot Noir expresses itself, you know, in Von Romani. Uh, yeah, and, and, and how different Tempranillo is uh, uh, in the Ribera de Duero versus uh, Rioja. Yeah, Rio, Rio um, you know, it's, I mean, it almost looks like, you know, the sand dunes of New Mexico. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, you know, there's just this, like, you know, vast kind of sandy river bottom area that stretches for about 40 miles from uh, Lagrano uh, on the east, you know, to uh, Aro uh, on, on the west. And it's just these, like, you know, almost sand dunes, yeah. you know, that, you know, that, you know, people, you know, have grow little vineyards in here and there, you know, and I think where they selected to grow vineyards are the areas where they found more minerals in those sand, yeah. you know, in all that sand. But the wines from the Rioa are typically, you know, lighter and, in my opinion, less expressive and the wine, and the, you know, all Tempranillo, uh, you know, but in the wines from the Ribera de Duero, again, all Tempranillo, you know, they've got richer and deeper expressions to them. Man, it's just uh, fascinating, and you know, to kind of to, to wrap this whole conversation up. I mean, such a great conversation. But but you were mentioning how you know Domain Romani Conti, which makes you know probably the most expensive wines in the world. How it's on a particular plot of land, and it's really uh, the, that land that uh, makes it so reputable. And basically, you know, their wines are you know you have to play with gold for them. Um, and you know, the, I heard similar things about Chateau Petrus. 
that within Pomerol, their uh, soil mix is just so specific. That's where their wines are more expressive than uh, just about any other uh, um, right bank wines. So it's, it's just, uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to add to that, Kevin. Yeah, in fact, uh, Petrus is interesting. Um, it is pretty much the highest point in Pomerol. Yeah. And, 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 um, and again, it's this little knoll that's all limestone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and their wine, um, I believe, is always 100% Merlot. Yeah. You know, and, you know, Merlot, you know, the movie Sideways turned yeah. it into a joke and, you know, and, and uh, Napa Valley turned it into, into a joke, too. You had a little wave of Merlot. It was like the red Pinot Grigio for a while. Yeah. And then everybody, like, overproduced it and it was yeah. awful. And the people were like, oh, Merlot, that's just terrible. Oh, really? Well, Petrus sells it for, for $3,000 a bottle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Chabot Blanc, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in fact, one one of the more fun wines in my portfolio is um, uh, I have a producer that's just a you know uh, a uh, uh, crew Bordeaux or a uh, or Bordeaux Superior producer, yeah. and it's only actually about eight miles from Pomerol, but it's on the south bank of the river in a region that's, that's called Entre Deux Mer, and and. Um, but this guy mainly grows Merlot, although he grows a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, uh, the vineyards are right on the river bank. And um, the, the, this particular river, the Dordogne, is the river that branches to the north from the Gironde that comes in from the Atlantic Ocean. And the Dordogne has its source up in what's called the Massif Central in the center of France, which again is this big like area of granite mountains in the center of France. And the vineyards of this particular producer in Entre du Mer on the south bank of the river are these big undulating gravel banks that is essentially deposited material of millions of years of rocks that have washed down from the Massif Central. And he, as I described earlier, he mainly grows Merlot, which people think of as, as kind of a joke. And um, the other thing he likes to do is vinify and mature everything in stainless steel. So first of all, strike one against it is Merlot. Yeah. Strike two against it is stainless steel. You obviously need all those new oak barrels to make wines taste like anything. But this wine has been incredibly successful, but not one of my clients will either tell people that, it ha that it's Merlot or that it was done in stainless steel. They describe it, oh, I've got this really rich, bright, expressive Bordeaux. And they're like, oh, cool, that's great. And they have no idea that they're drinking Merlot that was made in stainless steel. <laughs> Wait, hey, if you make good wine, you, you should make good wine, you know. So, so you, you see, I, I think, you, Kevin, we have to wrap up because I think we're going to be uh, cut off after one hour. But, man, this was such a fascinating uh, discussion. You know, we didn't even talk about chalk or clay or sand, uh, but, but, you know, it's just uh, so many fascinating wines and, you know, just uh, part of the whole adventurous uh, uh, drinking experience, you know, kind of like our motto, you know, drink different. So I think yeah. thanks for shedding the light on all these soils and how they uh, ex express themselves in these beautiful wines. Well, I'm happy to share my experiences. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you next time. All right. Good night, Igor. Right. Bye. 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 You know, it's just about...